Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Greenstein. He's going to be discussing keratoconus surgical options and, and where they fit in. Dr. Greenstein graduated from New York University and received his medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He completed a one-year pre-residency research fellowship where he graduated with a unique distinction in clinical research concentrating on keratoconus and corneal cross-linking with Dr. Peter Hirsch at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute. In addition, he completed an ophthalmology residency at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and a cornea refractive and external disease fellowship at Harvard Medical School. He is an assistant clinical professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and an associate team ophthalmologist for the New York Jets. That's so cool. He specializes in keratoconus, corneal, and refractive surgery, and his research interests include surgical treatment for keratoconus and novel techniques for cornea surgery. Dr. Greenstein is also involved in the several clinical research studies designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of new therapies and methods for keratoconus and refractive procedures. He's published multiple articles in prestigious medical journals, and many of these papers are considered to be landmark papers out of the U.S. on cross-linking. In addition to publications, he has presented at numerous scientific meetings on research related to keratoconus and has co-authored several book chapters on corneal collagen cross-linking for keratoconus and corneal ectasia. So I can't think of a better expert to discuss all of these things with us, all the keratoconus surgical options. So I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Greenstein take it away. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to uh, Wu University for uh, inviting me to uh, speak this morning. Um, so today, this uh, talk this morning is really going to talk and focus in on the surgical options uh, for keratoconus um, and where they fit into a general treatment plan for your keratoconus patients. Uh, I always kind of like to start with this slide at the beginning because so much has advanced in such a quick period of time when it comes to keratoconus management. And traditionally, keratoconus patients really had three options. They were able to wear glasses uh, and up to the point that they could not be refracted adequately. They were then uh, placed into specialty contact lenses, usually a rigid gas permeable lens. And once uh, they were no longer able to tolerate or be fit for a specialty contact lens, the only surgical option for them was a corneal transplant, which usually then resulted with them back in a specialty contact lens. And nowadays we have uh, so many new surgical options for these patients um, that it's a really exciting time uh, in keratoconus management. And we kind of have coined this approach to keratoconus treatment with this uh, KC123 approach. And by taking this step-by-step -step approach through a keratoconic patient, uh, it allows you to kind of view each patient individually and customize uh, keratoconus treatments for each patient. So I know that Dr. Gellies uh, focused a lot on corneal cross-linking yesterday, so we won't uh, focus on it a lot this morning. Uh, but just suffice to say that cross-linking is what has changed the paradigm and our ability to use these other surgical options for keratoconus patients. It remains the key in all treatment of keratoconus patients to achieve stability uh, of their keratoconus so that they don't progress and need uh, potentially uh, more involved uh, treatment. So cross-linking is the first and most important thing to decide about every patient uh, before moving forward with really any of the other uh, treatment algorithms and any progressive cross uh, any progressive keratoconic patient and a young keratoconic patient needs to be referred for cross-linking evaluation. Once the cornea is stabilized, then we can talk about how do we reshape the cornea, which will then hopefully improve our patient's uncorrected vision, glasses corrected vision, and contact lens tolerance and vision as well. And we have multiple modalities to improve patients' corneal topography. We have corneal inlays, we have topography-guided PRK, a conductive keratoplasty, and we still do use a corneal transplants when needed as well. So this is really going to be the main focus of today's talk is, is this portion of keratoconus management and really improving patients' uh, topography 
uh, for their eventual visual correction, which is the last portion of the KC123 approach. So once you've stabilized the patient's cornea, once you've improved a patient's corneal topography, then it's important to obviously correct their vision and glasses, contact lenses, and still some surgical modalities exist, which we will kind of lightly touch on at the end uh, of this talk. So as I said, the first uh, step in keratocotus management is stability. And once the patient has had their cross-linking done, then we move on to a topography guided uh, treatments. And the first topography guided surgery uh, that I wanna discuss this morning is eczema laser treatments, uh, which are topography guided. And topography guided LASIK was originally approved by the FDA in 2016. Now topography guided PRK in general uh, is an off-label uh, use of the laser. And uh, it is also off-label to use it for a keratoconus. Now, what is the difference between doing a topography guided eczema approach versus traditional LASIK or PRK that we know many patients who have undergone? So for traditional LASIK and PRK, when we're trying to correct a patient's refraction, we input the patient's refraction into the laser and it is that refraction which guides the laser treatment. So if you're going to treat nearsightedness, if you're going to treat myopia in the laser, you're going to flatten the center of the cornea based on a certain algorithm, and that's what's going to correct the refraction. If you want to treat hyperopia, you're going to flatten in the periphery to steep it in the center, again, guided in an algorithm by refraction. With topography-guided approaches, it's uh, very different. What we're using now is placido disc images, which then are inputted into the laser, and the laser then suggests an algorithm to flatten in the uh, steep areas and steepen in the flat areas of the cornea to create a more regular curvature. So below you can see an example of one of these uh, topography images that's generated by the laser. And what you can see is in this keratoconic patient, which is a pretty classic uh, placido image with then in the top right, steepening down below and flattening up top. You can see that when we move to the laser uh, algorithm, the laser wants to flatten over the cone, which is the purple area that you see on the right. And then it wants to steepen up top, which is the arc that you see uh, out in the top right. Um, and that is how it is suggesting to correct a patient's topography. So this can be a very powerful approach, uh, but it does require um, a certain amount of a give and take with the laser algorithm to be able to customize it for a keratoconic patient. Now there's a second aspect of topography guided treatment, which is very important when it comes to keratoconus. And that's the trans epithelial uh, approach. So standard PRK is done by removing the central nine millimeters of epithelium. This can be done manually. This can be done with a laser. Uh, there, are, there are many uh, approaches uh, to do that, but it's an even removal of the epithelium of the central nine millimeters. And then the eczema laser treatment is applied. In the keratoconic patients, uh, we leave the epithelium intact. Uh, we frequently leave the epithelium intact uh, and then uh, do our eczema treatment right over the top. And this actually is very advantageous uh, when it comes to the uh, treatment of keratoconic patients uh, because of the nature of the epithelium uh, around the uh, keratoconic cone. So if we look down at the bottom left, the blue area is the epithelium. And what you notice is that the epithelium over the cone is much thinner than around the cone. And this is the body's way of trying to smooth out the cornea and give the cornea its most regular shape. So this is why on OCT, we see what's called the bagel or donut pattern on the epithelial maps, which you can see on the right, which is the purple thin area of the epithelium over the cone with the yellow or orange thicker epithelium around the cone. And if we then apply our laser treatment directly over the epithelium, what you could see in the diagram on the bottom right is that the laser is going to hit the cone before it's going to hit the surrounding stromal tissue, which allows us to flatten the cone first and get a better, more symmetric uh, treatment while still preserving corneal tissue. 
So there's really two advantages to the transepithelial uh, approach. One is to limit the amount of corneal thinning uh, with the laser. And the other is to limit the myopic shift that the laser is going to induce with many of these treatments. So the corneal thinning is pretty easy to understand. The, the laser is going to, as I said, generate an algorithm, a suggestion of how it wants to uh, treat each individual patient and how it wants to flatten and make the cornea more symmetric. So in many of these cases, it's going to suggest large eczema ablations uh, to be able to make a keratoconic cornea more symmetric. So in this case, when we look at the uh, when we look at the deepest area of penetration, uh, we're talking about a eczema ablation of close to 98 microns. But if we take the epithelium into account and we leave the epithelium intact, the epithelium over the cone is about 45 microns. And we can limit that ablation that the laser wants to achieve to 50, about 53 microns. So this is a significantly less uh, removal of stromal tissue in an already thin cornea, but still focusing the action of the laser right over uh, the keratoconic cone. So we can get a lot of uh, symmetry uh, with less tissue removal. The second issue we have with this type of treatment is we have to account for how the laser wants to uh, make the cornea more symmetric. And if we look at our example uh, here, what you can see is that there is a flattening over the cone, and then there's a flattening with an arc up top. And this looks pretty similar to uh, a standard hyperopic treatment that you would see in the laser. And a hyperopic treatment in the laser is going to induce more myopia, which is intentional <clears throat> when we're doing refractive surgery, but can really shift the keratoconic uh, patient's refraction uh, to be significantly more myopic, which we're trying to avoid. But if we leave the epithelium intact, and as we uh, saw before, the thickest area is actually right in the area where the arc is going to pl be placed. What you can then see is that we're actually taking the same treatment and making it into more of a myopic astigmatic ablation because the arc up top is not going to penetrate through the epithelium. It's not even gonna to get to the stroma. And we're gonna only focus the action of the laser over the cone itself. So this is really able to limit our myopic shifts and preserve uh, corneal tissue in these patients who are already uh, thin. So we did a retrospective analysis of 25 eyes with keratoconus that we had done uh, this transepithelial approach. All of these patients had undergone cross-linking. And what we found was that we were able to improve uncorrected vision by about three and a half lines and best spectacle correction vision by 1.3, almost one and a half lines, uh, although that was not statistically significant. Now, what is also important is that it's not just the number of lines that were improving patient's vision, but the average vision improved by from about 2040 to about 2030. So these are really a significant change for the quality of life of these type of patients in glasses. In addition, we flattened the cone by about 4.7 diopters, so close to five diopters, and our average tissue removal was about 40 microns. So we were able to limit uh, tissue removal uh, in these cases and still get a pretty profound flattening effect. So putting that in perspective, uh, we're improving patients' uncorrected vision by about three and a half lines. So compared to cross-linking alone, which improves patients' uncorrected vision by about one line, and we're flattening the cone by close to five diopters, whereas cross-linking alone, epithelial off cross-linking on average will flatten a cone by about a diopter and a half. So a much more profound effect, which is why we see the visual and topographic results. So here's an example of a patient that we treated with topo-guided PRK, and he was a 48-year-old male who had had a lot of difficulty with both glasses and contact lenses, uh, mostly secondary to his job as a construction worker. So when he would wear his contact lenses because of the environment he's, he was in, uh, he was unable to tolerate wearing them for more than a couple of hours at work. And with glasses and uh, all of the uh, equipment that he was wearing over uh, his uh, face, he wasn't able to achieve uh, adequate vision uh, to do his job. And 
If we look at uh, his topographies, he has pretty classic uh, keratic bonus in both eyes with inferior steepening and a little bit of superior flattening. So in his case, we did a topography guided PRK. In his case, we did a cross-linking three months later. Sometimes we'll do it before, sometimes we'll do it after, depending on each case. And what you can see here is that his vision actually uncorrected went from 2200 to 2020 in his right eye and 2200 to 2025 in his left eye. And you can see why from the, the topography maps below each eye. In the center, when we look at his pre-op axial map, you can see the typical keratoconic cone. And after his treatment, you can see that in the center of his cornea, the cornea is essentially normal. It's all green with a normal curvature. And the difference map shows how uh, the laser was able to focus uh, right over the cone, right over the area that we're looking to make more symmetrical uh, to achieve this result. Now, in these type of patients, we can never guarantee that you're going to get to 2020 or 2025 vision in treating an irregular cornea, but we're seeing this more and more uh, with the uh, new algorithms that we're using. But not every patient's goal, it, and, not the, and the goal of topography guided PRK for every patient is not necessarily to get them out of glasses and contacts. In this case, uh, this was a 47 year old male, very uh, high functioning uh, and uh, working long hours uh, in an office. And he had tried pretty much every contact lens uh, out there. He had tried scleral lenses, he had tried hybrid RGP. There was no lens that he could wear for more than a couple of hours a day. And in his case, if we look down at his glasses vision, uh, he can only achieve a glasses correction of 2050, which was not adequate uh, for his day-to-day -day life or for his work. Now he had undergone cross-linking in both eyes. He had actually had an intax which had been placed and removed uh, because it was uh, causing too much uh, glare for him. So he was really uh, miserable. And you can see this is a more advanced keratoconic uh, uh, case. Uh, a much steeper cone than uh, I showed before. So this is not necessarily a case where we can sit and tell a patient, we're gonna make you 2020 uncorrected. In fact, telling a patient that with this uh, topography is really not realistic. And this was uh, a picture of his, his cornea after he had been wearing his contact lenses. You can see that his, just, his, his issue was his ocular surface primarily, but despite multiple uh, different ocular surface treatments and management, he really could not wear his lenses for more than a few hours. So we did a topography guided PRK uh, in his uh, left eye to start off with, and uh, he already had cross-linking done. And you can see here that uh, his vision went from 2400 to 2100 uncorrected, and we were able to now fit him with a standard soft toric lens and achieve a vision of 2020 minus. So this patient still wears glasses. He still wears a soft contact lens, but the topography guided PRK uh, was life-changing for him and was able to get him back to work. We then did the same thing for his other eye and achieved a very similar result. So topography guided PRK is a really powerful uh, treatment for patients who have keratoconus, and it has really opened up our ability to get patients uh, into uh, better uncorrected vision, better spectacle corrected vision, and also better contact lens vision. Now, corneal inlays still do have a role uh, in keratoconus, and uh, I'd like to kind of go through a little bit what that is uh, now, and then there has been significant advancement in the in corneal inlays, which is really very, very exciting uh, for the future. So there are multiple iterations of uh, intracorneal ring segments, primarily uh, in the US, the uh, intracorneal ring segment uh, that we use is Intax. And Intax was FDA approved for myopia in uh, the late 90s, and then it was approved under a human device exemption for keratoconus in 2004. And how do intacts work overall? So intacts reshape the cornea. They We place the intacts around the uh, cone, which then flattens inside of the intact segment. Uh, and this is what achieves the flatter uh, topography and a more symmetric topography uh, uh, post-op. Now, there is some thought that these intact segments may provide some amount of structural support to the cornea. 
Um, that still remains to be determined. Uh, we do treat all of our patients who have intacts uh, with uh, cross-linking uh, to stabilize their corneas. We don't consider the intact segment to stabilize their corneas alone, but there's probably some stability that comes uh, from their placement. And so this shine flug image uh, shows why we achieve flattening with an intact segment. So in yellow, this is the keratoconic cornea. This is pre-op. And you can see that uh, the steepening, which is happening right towards the right of the picture, the intact segment is placed right around the area of steepening. And then there's an elevation that happens over the top of the intact segment, which then results in flattening inside of the segment. So the flattening you're getting is not directly over the segment. The flattening you're getting is inside of the segment. And that's very important uh, for placement as well as analyzing uh, and pre-op planning. So how do we place these segments? Uh, generally now the channels are created with a femtosecond laser, the same laser that we use to create LASIK flaps. So we usually give patients uh, topical anesthesia, so anesthetic drops. We create the channels uh, with the femtosecond laser. The channels are then opened with blunt instruments. There's no sharp instruments needed uh, anymore. The intact segment is placed into its proper location. And generally, there's really no stitches uh, necessary at this point. Now, we published on 198 uh, keratoconic eyes that we had treated with both intacts and cross-linking. Uh, the purpose of the study that we published on was to do a prospective study on combining intacts with cross-linking versus placing intacts and performing cross-linking three months later to see whether or not there was any difference in the results. And overall, there was no difference in outcomes between patients who had their cross-linking done at the same time as uh, their intact segment and patients who had uh, their cross-linking done uh, three months later. But overall, what you can see is that on average, a cornea flattens by about two and a half diopters with an intact segment. Depends a little bit on the size of the segment that you place. The uh, thinner the segment, the less flattening you're gonna get. And on average, uh, the patients who uh, were treated with uh, intacts and cross-linking had improvement of uncorrected vision by about two lines and best spectacle corrected vision by just over one line. So again, in perspective of the treatments that we have, uh, if cross-linking generally improves your vision by about a line and a little less than a line of spectacle correction with about a diopter and a half of flattening, Intax definitely does a little bit more. It's about two and a half diopters of flattening with a line and a half, uh, a little less than a line and a half of spectacle corrective vision and two lines of uncorrected vision. So it definitely still has a role uh, to improving a certain patient's vision uh, before they get uh, refitted with contact lenses or corrected with glasses. And what we found when we looked at patients' visual satisfaction was that overall, most of the parameters of visual satisfaction did improve uh, significantly after intact and cross-linking treatment. So who are we looking to treat with uh, intacts and uh, cross-linking, really just intacts uh, in general? Mostly we use intacts at this point to improve patients' vision in glasses. Uh, we don't really use it at this point in uh, to improve patients' contact lens fittings. Uh, similar to the, the case that the case like I had showed with the topography guided PRK, um, we don't really use Intex anymore to uh, to to make it so that a patient would be uh, fit with a different type of contact lens. Mostly, we're using it uh, to improve glasses vision, um, and particularly, it works well if we're trying to improve the symmetry or the balance. Uh, in patients' uh, glasses vision to correct anisometropia. So here is a case where we used an intact segment. Uh, here's a 22-year-old uh, male. He had significantly worse keratoconus in his left eye than his right. It's a pretty typical case that we see with a very asymmetric keratoconus. Uh, you can see that he wears glasses. So uh, his uh, goal was not to be, uh, to have vision, to have uncorrected vision that was 20-20. Uh, but his glasses correct his right eye to 2020 um, and his left eye only to 2100. 
So this patient did undergo a single intact segment with uh, simultaneous cross-linking uh, done. And what you can see is that we were able to uh, we were able to take his spectacle correction uh, from 2100 and uh, now it's 2025 plus two. And again, you can see that the segment uh, which is placed right around the cone is post-op makes the cone, the pink and red area much smaller uh, and the flattening uh, happens right inside of the segment, uh, right over the cone itself. You can get a little bit of steepening uh, in the flat areas. This is the yellow that you see in the difference map. This is a, a corresponding steepening to the intact segment, uh, which is also very helpful uh, to achieve a better symmetry. And most important uh, for this patient, we have now uh, taken their uh, correction, which was uh, significantly anisometropic, and we have uh, made it more symmetric with a more symmetric correction in their spectacle uh, vision. Now, there are still some challenges, uh, as we all know, with intact segments, and uh, a lot of those challenges can come with fitting patients in contact lenses after these uh, segments are placed. And a lot of the challenge comes with uh, fitting the contact lens over the segment itself, because as we saw with the Scheinflug images uh, before, you get a pretty significant elevation, and now this elevation is in the periphery, uh, in the cornea. And it's very, very important that any contact lens that is fit on these patients doesn't uh, bear down, doesn't rub against this area of elevation, because that's when we see uh, areas where the epithelium can degrade, and sometimes we can see extrusion of the segment. Now we actually did look back at the intact segments that we placed and we uh, to determine uh, how often did we have to explant intact segments. So we looked at almost 600 intact segments that we placed, 593 total segments. And we found that uh, just about 6% of the time we had to remove an intact segment. Just over half of those explantations was for uh, optical reasons. Either subjectively, their uh, vision had gotten worse, they had uh, glare, additional halo, some di diplopia, or their actual correction uh, had gotten worse, um, in which case the segment was removed. But more concerning was still that about just under half of them, 2.6%, were removed for some form of medical complications. Uh, some were for uh, infectious uh, keratitis, uh, but most were a non-infectious uh, keratitis, which would then lead to corneal melt and an extrusion of uh, the segment. Now, fortunately, when you do remove these segments, uh, the keratitis generally does resolve um, and the patients are able to be refit uh, in contact lenses uh, or glasses, uh, but it can be a very uh, challenging uh, period of time for these patients. So knowing that we do have uh, these cases where we have to explant uh, uh, intact segments, uh, there's the exciting uh, developments in corneal tissue inlays. It, it is really creating these inlays from corneal tissue itself. And corneal tissue uh, provides us with many uh, advantages uh, when we place it inside the cornea. It has obvious improved biocompatibility. You're placing corneal tissue directly in the cornea uh, as opposed to synthetic segments. It gives us a much wider range of patients that we can treat because we, can, uh, we have a much wider range of tissue that we can place. And we really aren't uh, limited by the thickness of the cornea uh, because in these cases, we're actually adding corneal tissue. So whereas with an inlay such as Intax, we are limited by thickness uh, in patients' corneas. With these uh, segments, we're really not. And there are multiple uh, different uh, formulations of corneal tissue inlays. Uh, they're at different stages of development, uh, but uh, the one that I just wanna briefly focus on is corneal ring segments that are developed from corneal tissue. And here's uh, an example of why these ring segments are so powerful. 
Uh, these are two uh, segments of corneal tissue that we uh, designed in our office and we placed uh, in these two patients' corneas. And you can see that in the top, this is a very severe case of keratoconus. It's a patient who has a maximum keratometry around 73 diopters. And if this patient can't wear contact lenses and needs surgical intervention, historically, this patient is going to require a corneal transplant. There's nothing that we have discussed so far that would be able to flatten this patient's cornea adequately uh, to correct their vision. And on the bottom, we have a case that's the total opposite, a very, very mild case of keratoconus, uh, a uh, maximum keratometry probably around 55 diopters. And what you can see is these segments, when you uh, customize them for each patient, they achieve a very predictable result, which is that if you look in the center pictures, the post-op pictures, you can see how much more symmetric and how much flatter both patients' corneas uh, we, can, we can achieve with the segment. So in the difference map in the top right, we flatten the patient's cornea by almost 20 to 25 diopters, and we've achieved a symmetric uh, central corneal astigmatism. And in the picture in the bottom right, we flatten the patient's cornea by just under five diopters, so about 4.7 diopters, and we've achieved the same symmetric result. So it's not always about how much you can flatten the cornea, but it's about it's it's how much you can flatten the cornea for each individual patient. The other advantage of these segments is, as we just discussed, the intact segment elevates the cornea in the periphery, which can be challenging to fit contact lenses over. Uh, and the corneal tissue inlays really maintain the natural contour uh, of the lens. So this is a case where we actually removed an intact segment and we placed one of these inlays in the patient's cornea. And you can see that over the top of the inlay, while it still achieves flattening inside of the, uh, inside of the inlay, it has a much more symmetric contour to the cornea uh, in the periphery. And here's an example of a thinner a segment that we replaced. Again, there is a mild elevation over the segment, but it is much easier to fit the uh, contact lens over this uh, more natural uh, curvature that remains in the cornea. And there's still uh, a role for a corneal transplant um, and uh, treatments for patients who do develop a significance, for keratoconic patients who do develop a significant scarring. Now, one of the dreaded complications that we still have to deal with uh, in keratoconus is acute high drops. Um, there are many uh, treatments that are now being worked on and used uh, more frequently to try to uh, improve patient outcomes and also to, uh, to make the recovery from high drops faster. Uh, traditionally, we have observed high drops. Uh, generally, uh, the corneal edema, although it looks very profound at the beginning and can be very scary to see, Generally, it does resolve over time. And many times it leaves uh, significant scarring, but many times that scarring is outside of the visual axis. And for a lot of these patients, if their scarring ends up outside of the visual axis, they can be refit with a contact lens um, and they will do very well even without a corneal transplant. But uh, there are many cases of more central uh, high drops where patients will be left with a significant uh, scar and those patients do go on to need a corneal transplant. So uh, things like DMEC, uh, endothelial keratoplasty uh, placed in the area of the decimase break, uh, suturing the break, or using gas or air to tamponade the break have all been used uh, to varying degrees of success uh, to try to uh, improve the corneal edema quicker, limit the scarring, uh, and get patients back into their lenses uh, and more functional quicker. Now, with even patients who have corneal scarring do warrant uh, an attempt to improve their vision with contact lenses, because with modern day contact lenses, especially the uh, scleral lenses and higher order aberration correcting scleral lenses, uh, frequently scarring that is uh, not in the visual axis or scar very light scarring in the visual axis, can those patients can still achieve adequate vision uh, in their specialty contact lens. But those that cannot should be then uh, referred for corneal transplantation. 
Now, in general, uh, our rate of corneal transplants, uh, full thickness corneal transplants, uh, has been decreasing uh, over the years. And most of that decrease is really because of endothelial keratoplasty uh, taking the place of uh, corneal transplants for diseases like Fuchs or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. But we've also seen a decrease in the need for corneal transplant for keratoconus uh, since about 2016. And 2016 was when crosslinking was officially FDA approved in the US. So it does appear that crosslinking and particularly early crosslinking, uh, where we can stabilize a patient's cornea, does prevent patients from going on to need a uh, corneal transplant, uh, which is very important. So it is very important to find and diagnose these patients early uh, to get them into crosslinking early so that they don't end up uh, potentially needing uh, a transplant down the road. Now, there's really two types of transplants that we do for patients with keratoconus. The deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which is transplanting everything as close or all the way down to decimase as possible, but leaving the patient's natural decimase and endothelium intact. This is ideal for patients who have uh, corneal scarring uh, that does not involve uh, decimase or the endothelium uh, because the patient can maintain their natural uh, endothelium. Uh, and then there's penetrating keratoplasty, which is a full thickness transplant. This is the traditional transplant that most patients had uh, in years past. Um, and we still do use it for uh, patients who have uh, full thickness corneal scarring, uh, particularly scarring from high drops. Uh, there are some uh, case re uh, reports now of doing DALT in high drops as well, um, but primarily still penetrating keratoplasty is used um, in those cases. Also patients who have endothelial pathology, so if a keratoconic patient has fuchs, um, then usually doing a full thickness transplant makes more sense. Now there was a large meta-analysis that was comparing uh, full thickness transplants, penetrating keratoplasty with DALC. And the, there was significantly more adverse outcomes with full thickness transplants and significantly more cataracts, graft rejection, and high intraocular pressure. And, and this makes sense because a full thickness transplant is going uh, all the way down into the anterior chamber. And so you're going to get uh, more complications uh, intraocularly. Uh, and graft rejection can also happen now at the endothelial level, which you can't have with a dull. And so it adds just more opportunity for graft rejection with a full thickness transplant. Now, the better outcomes that were significant in DALC were that there was an improved endothelial cell count, which also makes sense, the patients uh, maintaining their natural uh, endothelium. And there was uh, an improved uh, spherical equivalent. The outcomes that were better, although it wasn't statistically significant, was that there was a best corrected, uh, better best corrected visual acuity uh, and topographic uh, and refractive cylinder in penetrating keratoplasty and this probably makes sense because uh, there is still an interface in many of the cases with DALC uh, that may limit some of the vision, as well as the suturing is a little bit different in DALC, which may uh, account for some of the uh, cylindrical differences. Now, why hasn't DALC taken off and uh, everybody uh, getting DALC done? DALC is definitely a more challenging uh, surgery to do. Uh, you have to either dissect down as far as you can towards decimase or use some technique to get down to decimase uh, safely without perforating. And the big bubble, groove and peel, grip and rip, there's a, a whole host of these techniques that have been used to try to more uh, reproducibly get down to decimase um, and achieve a more reproducible dull result. Now, the femtosecond laser, again, similar to the laser we use for LASIK and for Intex, can also potentially achieve uh, and be advantageous for a corneal transplant. And most of the advantage may come from the ability to create different uh, cuts uh, in the cornea to create a better wound architecture between the at the graft host junction, with, which hopefully would lead to better visual results. Um, studies have shown uh, that uh, so in some cases this is true, in some cases is, it, it is not. Um, it definitely likely leads to the ability to take stitches out sooner because the apposition of the wound 
um, and the wound healing is likely uh, is likely quicker uh, with the femtosecond laser. But where the laser may offer significant advantage is in the reproducibility of DALC, because the laser, especially an OCT guided laser, can allow us to uh, more predictably cut down towards the decimase layer. And if we can predictably cut down towards decimase, then we can use one of the other approaches, the big bubble or a groove and peel uh, to dissect down uh, deeply and reproducibly um, and this may be uh, very advantageous for DALC in the future. So the last, uh, for the last few minutes uh, this morning, I just want to touch on once we have uh, improved the keratoconic patient's topography, uh, how do we then uh, correct their vision? And of course, we want to get them to the best uncorrected vision we can. Most of these patients are not going to achieve an adequate uncorrected uh, vision uh, an adequate functional uncorrected vision. Now, some of these patients after these topography guided surgeries will achieve a more functional glasses vision, some to the point that they will only wear glasses, but others to the point that they can achieve a functional glasses vision so that they don't have to entirely rely on their contact lenses. One of the things that we've seen uh, in our clinic is that over the years, just like any patient who would wear their contact lenses all the time, uh, keratoconic patients, even with uh, well-fitting specialty contact lenses, do begin to develop contact lens intolerance as time goes on. And so, and most of these patients are wearing their lenses 12 to 16 hours a day because their only function comes from wearing a contact lens. So if we can make their uh, spectacle correction more functional, even in a 2040 or a 2050 range for a severe keratoconic patient, they then are able to wear their glasses when they come home at night, maybe over the weekend, and then wear their contact lenses during the day when they need the hours of most functioning. This can really extend their ability to wear contact lenses over time. And it's a really important area to highlight where topographic surgery uh, can really improve these patients' quality of life. We can still use some PRK refractively uh, to improve their vision in certain cases. And uh, implantable intraocular lenses uh, can also be uh, used to achieve a visual correction. And we're not going to dive too deeply in the implantable lenses, but uh, what I wanted to kind of show with this diagram is a little bit how we think about and how we use topography-guided uh, treatment to then achieve a better uh, refractive and visual correction result. And I want to focus in the middle of uh, this slide at the moderate and the uh, severe cases. So in these cases, if, if patients are looking for that improved spectacle correction, even again, if it's not perfect, a spectacle correction, we can then, in the moderate cases, when they have irregular astigmatism, we can use our topography altering techniques. We can use topography guided PRK. We can use intacts. We can use now tissue uh, inlays to improve their topography so that we can then place an intraocular lens, whether it be a phacic lens like an ICL or a pseudophacic uh, implant after cataract surgery to achieve a better spectacle and sometimes uncorrected visual result. We can also use DALC or uh, penetrating keratoplasties in the cases of more severe scarring uh, to achieve a better vision uh, within an intraocular lens placed either at the same time or uh, afterwards. And so this is uh, the last case, which I wanna wrap up on, but I think it kind of puts the whole uh, picture together. This was a 33-year-old uh, keratoconic uh, male. Uh, he had keratoconus in both eyes, uh, but again, a uh, asymmetric uh, keratoconus. Uh, and his right eye was 2400 uncorrected and 2030 in the left eye. So for him, actually, from the standpoint of his left eye, he feels like he doesn't even need much correction at all. And when he wears glasses, he gets to about 20-25 vision with 2080 vision in his right eye. And clearly, he's very anisometropic. So you can see why he has uh, this big difference in his uh, correction. He has a much more severe keratoconus in his right eye uh, than his left eye. His maximum keratometry in his right eye is oh, well over 60 diopters, where in his left eye, it's under 50. He did have cross-linking done in both eyes to stabilize his corneas. 
And then we worked on improving his topography. So at first he had an intact segment placed and that did improve his topography uh, and flatten his cornea, but uh, not adequately enough. So finally we did a topography guided PRK for him. And now you can see he had a much flatter, uh, much more uh, regular symmetric cornea in the center. So if we look up top here, we see that at the very beginning, he had a uh, typical uh, keratoconus with the inferior steepening. After his intacts, we were able to centralize the cone and flatten the cone. And then after his PRK, you can see how much more regular we were able to make uh, his astigmatism. And the difference after all of these procedures was done, was done is all the way on the right. So now his uncorrected vision went from 2400 to 2160, and his spectacle correction went from 82080 to 2025. So this is an excellent result as he was 2025 in spectacle correction in his other eye. But he's still fairly, uh, he's still fairly anisometropic. Um, and his uncorrected vision is still very different between his two eyes. So in his case, because we achieved enough symmetry in his cornea and he has good spectacle correction, we went to the next step of visual correction and we placed a fake intraocular lens, in this case, the ICL. And so when you place the ICL, you place it in the sulcus in front of the fake lens and behind uh, the iris. And now we were able to take his uncorrected vision from 2160 to 2030 while maintaining his spectacle correction at 2025 and his manifest refraction is now very much in line with his other eye. So we have been able to take this patient and make his life and, his, and, the, and the symmetry between his two eyes and his binocular vision much, much, uh, much better. So, it still remains most important in keratoconic patients to diagnose them early and stabilize their corneas. And there have been many, many lectures given today, uh, uh, yesterday and, and ones that are gonna be given today, uh, which will help uh, achieve earlier diagnosis uh, so that these patients can be stabilized. And once they're stabilized, we now have the ability to really customize our surgical approach to achieve their quality of life results. For some patients, that might be uncorrected vision. For some patients, that might be spectacle correction. And for others, that might be a better contact lens fit. But we can now achieve all of those results for our keratoconic patients. And so, like I said at the beginning, this is really one of the most exciting times uh, for keratoconus management. So thank you for your attention. That was awesome. Really fascinating material, Dr. Greenstein. Thank you.